failing IT, we can start. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 20-5144, Jens Borup, <coughs> appellant versus Central Intelligence Agency. Mr. McClanahan for the appellant, Mr. Handel for the appellate. All right, good morning, Mr. McClanahan. Before you begin, I understand from the uh, clerk that you may have some technical problems. And if we lose you, uh, we'll just take the rest of your argument on the brief. Thank you, Your Honor, but I don't expect any technical problems. I was just telling her that if in the off chance there are technical problems, I might not be able to connect that. All right, please proceed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the court, my name is Kel McClanahan. I am here to argue for the plaintiff, Jens Porup. This is a fairly straightforward case of what rules of evidence apply and how a statute is interpreted. No matter how many things are thrown into the mix, that's really what it boils down to. And there are a lot of issues that were in the briefs and that were especially if uh, you listen to the, the CIA's argument, were in the briefs below that were not passed upon below. But I'm gonna stress two major things. Well, three, if you, if you count one being split in two. The first one is sort of the elephant in the room. And that is the issue of whether or not CIA has proven that its policy or its alleged policy uh, has mooted the case, its new policy. This, this practice, this internal guidance that, uh, agent, that officers should not decline, quote unquote, to process records that are based on the fact that they are allegedly beyond the scope of the CIA's mandate. We believe that even under the best interpretation of the facts, this has not met the Friends of the Earth mootness test. That, you know, as, as the Supreme Court said, you know, it has to say that subsequent, subsequent events made it absolutely clear that the allegedly wrongful behavior could not reasonably be expected to recur. That is not anything that has been met. Here. The counsel for the other side assures us that that's what they meant to say today, and that's in an opinion. But wouldn't that be the end of it? Uh, Your Honor, I don't believe so because the council cannot testify and the council cannot provide evidence. And the only evidence in the record is this declaration that, that cherry picks from an alleged policy that even according to their council may or may not even be written. And they're basically just asking you to take their word for it. And that gets to the second point of FOIA is kind of a unique animal in litigation where it doesn't generally go to trial. It doesn't generally go to discovery. And as Can I ask you, suppose the policy were firm and definite. What the, the, stated, the stated policy, new policy and the Shiner Declaration were firm and definite. Would that then moot the case? It seems I think like, we would concede that. It seems like the new policy is significantly different from what you allege, and at least in my view, would pretty clearly be lawful. Yes, so, Your Honor. So the whole case just on this point comes down to whether, um, whether the statement, whether the policy was stated in sufficiently mandatory terms and whether Ms. Shiner has sufficient authority and gravitas to speak for the government on that point. Correct. Well, that's one of the points, Your Honor. And but yes, to to your statement, if they introduced through admissible evidence that, that the existence of a definite policy that would 
say that this is not left up to the discretion. This is not something that the processors should or should not do. As you characterize it, then yes, we would admit that that, that uh, moots the point. And in fact, we said that when to the district court. So, so speaking of cherry picking then, when you look at the entire declaration, you focus on a couple of words which might or might not be mandatory in isolation. Um, you know, there's a should, for instance, but there are, there are a lot of mandatory verbs in the overall description of the policy, instructed, required mandates. Isn't the, the most fair reading of that entire paragraph is that this is a, this is a binding rule going forward? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Our position is that the, the things that are mandatory are conditional, that they mandate that a FOIA processor uh, consider whether or not they should uh, refuse to process a request. Yes, it is mandatory that they, follow, according to a, a generous reading of this, Mm -hmm. They are, in fact, we would concede that if this policy is as characterized, they are required to follow this policy. However, that's like saying that I am required to think about what I will say before I say it. It yeah. doesn't say what I have to say. Be because required is too amorphous or because the requirement itself is only to make an assessment case by case, and that's not firm enough. That, that latter point, Your Honor. That, that is our point, that the requirement is that they seriously think about whether or not they should do it, and they are discouraged from doing it, but they're still free to do it on a case by case basis. Would it be unlawful? Suppose the CIA gets a FOIA request for all documents related to um, covert operations to secure passage of the Affordable Care Act. Could they lawfully just say, look, that's crazy. We don't do that stuff. We've never done that stuff. We're just not going to make that search. They are not allowed to not search. What they are allowed to do is no process no how far afield the request is from anything that they ever have done or could do. They always right. have now, to what they can do is they can say that the request does not reasonably describe records that they would have. They can say that it would be unduly burdensome. They can say that, you know, we, we could not determine where to search because we don't do this sort of thing. They, they can do the things that they do all the time and some maybe even do a search for Affordable Care Act and the Office of Congressional Affairs or something. What they can't do is say, we're not going to do it because we don't do that. For, they're required to process a FOIA request. No, but the fair reading of the policy is they make a case-by-case -case judgment about whether the, there's any reasonable possibility that the search will produce responsive records. And if the answer to that question is obviously enough no, then they don't do the search. Your Honor, I would uh, take a, a little bit of issue with that characterization, but I'm trying to find the exact policy statement that they quoted. It says uh, they're, what I have in my notes is they're required to assess case by case whether agency records are likely to contain responsive material. And that just, that seems to me okay as an abstract statement. Well, and Again, the, the, this court may rule that way. We would maintain that they are that FOIA requires them to process a FOIA request unless it is unduly burdensome, or does not uh, request uh, describe the record sought, or that it is the records are exempt. That is it. FOIA is straight up about what you can and can't do, and this is not something you'd be creating new law. Even if but, even if it's with respect to a matter that they have. No engagement with whatsoever. This happens all the time. For instance, in the CIA, they, the, get, the a, NSA. they get a request to know what were the um, uh, who was considered, who did the Washington football team consider <laughs> in recent drafts, and that you want all the information they have on that. 
they've got to search. They can. They don't have Do to search, way, but they. Hey, let me make. Let me make sure I understand okay. what you're saying. If they get something that's patently absurd, and I happen to think my hypothetical raises a patently absurd situation, they want all the information the CIA has on Washington football teams' private discussions on who to draft. They can't say we don't do that. They can say that we can't construct a record. Or we can't construct a search, which is not what they're doing. They're just yeah, saying. I want to make sure I understand. That. So there are some things that are just patently absurd. They can say that's that we can't even get started on that. That's that's beyond the pale for us. Okay, however you want to put it. So we agree on that. No, Your Honor, we do not agree that they well, simply what they tell me what they tell me what they would be legal in your view, what they would legally be required to do with respect to the Washington football team requested search. They would be required to do what the NSA does when they're asked about people who have microchips implanted in their bodies. They would have to say we could not determine where to search. They would have to say this is an unduly burdensome search because we would have to search every record to find this needle in a haystack if it exists. Or they would have to conduct a search of some office knowing that the result would be uh, no, and then say we had no records. This is what the intelligence agencies deal with every day. Okay. All right. And, and, and to get to a different point, because I'm about to run out of time, I did stress that it's through admissible evidence. Because FOIA doesn't go to trial, the application of the rule that the best evidence rule doesn't apply in summary judgment makes it nonsensical because as I said in my brief, and I'll just sort of very briefly rehash, the an agency can, as I said before, cherry pick whatever it wants from a policy statement and then cherry pick it again and then cherry pick it again. Well, and I'm, again, at I'm no not point. I'm not understanding uh, along the lines of my colleague. They said they shall not, agency personnel should not decline to process requests solely because of matters at issue are beyond the scope of the agency's primary mission, which is what you wanted, except you don't like should not decline. You want will not decline. Is that right? Or shall not decline. Yes. But, yes. Shall but I, I would I would take will. All right. So if you had shell or will, the, it's moot, right? If they can prove it. And this gets if, back wait, 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 to wait. Best... Let me let me do it a step at a time. OK, indulge me. If you had shell or will, it's moot, right? If are we setting aside whether or not it's admissible, then yes. If we had a policy statement, for instance, if that you said had that, it would be a moved. policy statement that said or was the equivalent of shell or will, it's moot, right? Correct. All right. Let me ask you my question again, which is what I started out with. If counsel for the other side says my assurance and pursuant to all of my ethical obligations, I can assure you that that is the agency's position and we write that in an opinion and say the agency's position the words seem a little loose here or there but it is a shell and we the court are saying that's the mandate what's left we've done this before that's the end of it you have an enforceable mandate you're in no worse position than if you had shell or will in the written policy and they don't follow it the way you want you have a mandate and you'd have to come back in either case. If we sh say in our opinion, counsel has assured us that they meant to moot the case by granting the policy as requested, it's done. Case is over, right? If you say that, that yes, is a different- we say Well, that's what that, I asked you to start it out because it seems so obvious to me. That was my first question to you. And you, you resist- they... Sorry, go ahead. I said, if I ask counsel, now he may not say that, but if I ask counsel, is he assuring me the way pain and, and friends of the earth are requiring that this is done? And I, we write it in an opinion, it's done. Is it done? If you write it in an opinion, I would argue that it's close to done, but I don't think he can say that any more than, why would you take his word over mine? Because You cannot take the word of a counsel. Because he's an attorney and he's appearing before the court and he has certain ethical responsibilities. He may not understand the, the entire scope of it. It, it, it. This is why lawyers aren't allowed to be fact witnesses. Okay. And I, got, I got your point. 
All right, All right. Judge Katsas, do you have any questions? I'm all set. All right, your time is up. We'll give you a couple minutes. Mr. Handel. Good morning, your honors, and may it please the court, Josh Handel on behalf of the Central Intelligence Agency. What's um, the answer so, to my question, counsel? Um, Judge Edwards, uh, so, so just, just to make sure that um, I'm clear, your question is, um, do we understand this policy to be binding on CIA's processors? And the answer is yes. And I believe right. and, that- and So let me just take the words that at least leap out pretty straightforwardly. Agency personnel should not decline to process requests uh, solely because the matters at issue are beyond the scope of the agency's primary mission, which is the fight here. I'm asking you as counsel for the agency, is it your understanding that the government's position on this is that that's mandatory? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. And, you know, just to perhaps gild the lily a bit here, we think that that's reflected in other uh, pieces of the description. Of oh, the I policy. understand. You understand the point he's made. There are, there's loose language here or there, but I still can ask you because there's enough for me in my mind to ask you the question. Uh, is it your understanding? Because if that is captured in an opinion, then you, you and the agency have new responsibilities because it would be captured pursuant to your assurance that the, the policy is mandatory. And that means it would have to be mandatory going forward. Yes, Your Honor. I, I understand that, um, uh, that, that this policy was communicated to processors as CIA's understanding of its obligations under FOIA and as such is mandatory on the agency by operation of statute and mandatory on CIA's employees by operation of the employer employee relationship. I think the, the should shall um, distinction in language is just explicable through the fact that CIA was not engaged in lawmaking here. It was just giving a, an internal directive to its employees. And um, I think that that's a fairly normal way for an employer to speak to its employees. Well, but under pain, I mean, we went through this back and forth in, in the pain case. It's perfectly fair for the other side to ask the agency or to be sure that the person who's giving this assurance really has the authority to do it and that it really is an assurance. That's a perfectly fair question. And that's what I'm trying to confirm from you. Absolutely, Your Honor, and I'm not disagreeing with any of that. Um, I'm just trying to offer um, kind of the the basis for my understanding that right. this policy is mandatory. Right. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that the panel has about other issues in this case. Could I, could I ask you about exemption three? Sure. So the district court thought this case was, when, when you take out exemption one, exemption six and the CIA act, the district court thought the remaining dispute was about two documents. As I understand it, it's actually about portions of maybe 21 documents. One thing we could do is just remand for the district court to um, right. make the assessment on all the other documents. So why shouldn't we do that as the path of least resistance and it gives the first instance court the first shot at this? Sure, Judge Katzis. So I, I think that that would be um, a purely cosmetic remand because the express rationale underlying the district court's holding was tethered to a representation by Ms. Shiner in um, the Shiner Declaration that we submitted. And that representation covered all of the information withheld by CIA um, under Exemption 3 in conjunction with the National Security Act. That was specifically um, Ms. Shiner's representation as to the, the harms to national security that would be occasioned by disclosure of this information. The district court correctly noted that Ms. Shiner was making that representation as to all of the information being withheld under exemption three. Um, and the court then cited three decisions of this court, Wolf, Sims, and Center for National Security Studies for their holdings directing district courts to extend substantial deference to executive affidavits predicting harm to national security. So at the end of the day, the district court's holding rested on representations that expressly applied to all of the records withheld or redacted under the National Security Act. The court's 
admitted misstatement of um, the exact number of records implicated by that holding doesn't unsettle the judgment, which was compelled by the court's crediting of Ms. Shiner's prediction of harm. That that representation in Ms. Shiner's um, affidavit has not been controverted, at, at least before this court, it has not been controverted by Mr. Porup. And I think that um, it is certainly within this court's um, power and discretion to affirm on that basis. Okay. Let me ask you, Mr. Handel, for me, the only uh, even remotely close issue in this case is the segreg segregability. segregability. And our court has been uh, on both sides of it. Uh, most recently in, I think, Machado Amadis, we held that we could perform that function. So could you address that? Absolutely, Judge Henderson. Um, so uh, you are correct that um, the, the district court did not mention anything about segregability in its summary judgment order. Um, this court has sometimes treated it as reversible error for a district court not to make a segregability finding sua sponte, even when, as here, it's not directly controverted between the parties. Um, but, but as you mentioned, Your Honor, you have also held that it is not necessary to remand solely for that purpose. Um, we cited the Juarez versus Department of Justice case from 2008 um, on pages 48 and 49 of our brief, where this court noted that because its review of summary judgment is de novo and it has the same record and the same affidavits before it as did the district court, um, you are just as capable of evaluating the agency's affidavits regarding segregability as was the court below. And I think that's um, uh, especially appropriate to do when, as here, you have um, an, an unrebutted, uncontroverted representation of non-segregability in the affidavit that CIA submitted. Um, and again, Mr. Porup did not uh, dispute that in the district court. He has not um, offered any reasons to doubt the, the veracity and the good faith presumption that attaches to that affidavit before this court. Um, so I think that the Juarez line of cases says that, again, it is certainly within your power and discretion so you to want to affirm. Rest, you want to rest on, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting, you want to rest on um, summary judgment law, that is the NOVA review. We're doing the same thing the district court would do if we remanded it, is, is your claim. And we're looking at uncontested material. Is that, am I understanding you correctly? Th that's correct, Judge Edwards, yes. All right, so you just want to rest on the standard review. It's our call to make, and we... There's nothing contested here, and we ought to go ahead and make the call. Well, I, I, I think here, um, you know, if if you were just going, as as you said in the Juarez case, if you were just going to remand for the district court to enter um, an uncontested segregability finding, um, right. that is, you know, just a, a rote operation of the district court, there, there's really no reason to prolong the case and go through the whole um, vacater and remand procedure. Okay. All right. Unless the court has further questions, I'll rest on my brief and respectfully request that you affirm the judgment below. Thank you. All right. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Mr. McClanahan, why don't you take two minutes? Uh, thank you. And I will just very quickly uh, jump on the segregability issue just because that proves the point we've been making. The fact that the judge did not enter segregability uh, is a material question as to whether or not as Mr. Handel was presuming, he was uh, ruling, the, the district judge was ruling on the entire blanket withholding claimed by CIA or was doing a fact-by-fact, -fact, document document analysis. And this gets back around to the point that I was discussing with Judge Edwards of what can counsel testify to? And counsel is telling you what he thinks the district judge meant. No, 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 no. That's not the thrust of my question. Under standard law, under uh, standard of review inquiries, we do the same thing the district court does if it's a summary judgment. And if there are simply documents to look at to make the determination, we have some case law that says we can go ahead and make it. That's what you do in summary judgment. We can make this. We don't need, we don't give any deference to the district court's determination if uh, it's a straight up summary judgment matter and we can look at it and determine whether or not there are material facts in dispute. 
Right. And, and I wasn't saying that was what you just said. I'm saying that during my original oral argument, when you and I were discussing the counsel, he's saying, well, it's clear that the judge. No, but meant- what? No, but the question now on segregability is why would we send it back? Why isn't that something we can do in the context of this case on this record? It's pretty straightforward. You, you can, and that's not the point I was trying to make. I was okay. trying to show that the lack of segregability, the lack of a segregability finding shows that the district judge did not apply it, the analysis of the National Security Act to all of the documents in controversy, because if only that would have been an advisory opinion after saying that oh, there are only two documents in controversy, and by the way, I'm going to say that everything else is exempt too. Judges don't do that. I mean, good judges don't do that. And this is a good judge. Uh, I'm going to change gears very quickly just to uh, make a point about the CIA Information Act before I run out of time. You are um, out of time, so make it very I am out of time. Okay. I just wanted to point out that in the House report for the CIA Information Act, it talks about how CIA has to search operational files when CIA conducts an internal investigation of allegations of impropriety or illegality in the conduct of an intelligence activity, whether through its or the Office of Director, Inspector General, General Counsel, anywhere. It doesn't have to be a congressional committee doing it, and it doesn't have to be a plaintiff pointing out that a secret CIA internal investigation happened. If a CIA internal investigation happened, they have to search operational files for it. They did not represent that they did, and that is, by itself is enough to send it back for adequacy of the search over operational files. If you have any questions, I'm here. Otherwise, I would respectfully request that the court reverse and remand this case to the district court. All right, counsel, the case is submitted. Madam Clerk, will you call the next case? <clears throat> Case number 20-1009 et al. American Security Programs, Inc. Petitioner versus National Labor Relations Board. Mr. Dowd for the petitioner, Mr. Hickson for the respondent. Mr. Dowd, good morning. Please proceed. Uh, Good morning. Uh, May it please the court. uh, My name is Tom Dowd and I represent petitioner American Security Programs, Inc., who I'm going to refer to hereafter as ASP. Um, ASP has petitioned this court to review a decision and an order was issued by the National Labor Relations Board. The board's decision held that ASP violated the National Labor Relations Act by implementing its final offer in the absence of a valid impasse in bargaining. ASP contends that this finding is not supported by substantial evidence on the record. ASP also contends that the board has failed to act in a manner that is consistent with its own precedent decisions on certain important points of law, particularly regarding lawful bargaining tactics. Um, ASP is a federal contractor, and that status as a federal contractor is what really distinguishes the present case from the many refusal to bargain cases that I know this court routinely sees and reviews. Um, Those cases generally involve situations where an employer has been accused of trying to avoid reaching an agreement or where the employer is trying to keep the wage rates as low as he can in order to generate greater profit for operating its business. As a federal contractor, ASP wants to get collective bargaining agreements in place. And all the steps that it was taking in connection with this case were lawful steps designed to put pressure on the union to reach a contract, not to either avoid a contract or keep the cost of the contract down. Because whatever wage rates are agreed to, um, as long as they are approved by the federal government, ASP passes them through. Um, the, the challenge for ASP is trying to keep those rates at ones that will be approved, because if they're not approved, ASP is contractually obligated to, to pay the rates, um, even if it doesn't get approval from the government to reimburse those rates. And counsel, I understand all of that, but my understanding of the record <clears throat> is that <clears throat> that point was really not a matter of uh, any significant discussion during negotiations. Indeed, well, you, you hid some information, and I'm not questioning your integrity or the, your client's integrity. I'm not uh, 
doubting or, or suggesting they should have done otherwise one way or the other, but you hid some information with regard to renewal of the contract. You certainly didn't make the union aware of it. So the point you're making now was really not in play. You were not saying, look, here's the posture we're in as a federal contractor, and there's some urgency because of that. Quite the contrary. Well, I, I would disagree that they didn't. I was not involved in negotiations in this I'm matter. Not, I'm not blaming my, anybody. I'm just... My, my point, I, I appreciate that. All right. but I would disagree with, the, with two characterizations. Number one, they absolutely made it clear throughout the negotiation process, according to the record, that there were these dates that were going to be coming up and they needed to have contracts in place by those dates. Because if a date runs by, like a, here we had a date of um, December 1st where a contract was going into place. And, the, and the, the Federal Protective Service needs 10 days in advance of that date right. to, to get the contract. Because right. if you miss the date and you get in, enter into a contract a week, two weeks, one month, two months after it, that you're fine. You got your contract, yeah, but no, they no, won't I, reimburse I, under it until the end of that I, year. I totally understand that, but I must say it was certainly not a highlighted point. And, and if it, all of this was so important, why did they hide the information about, about the renewal? when it happened? Well, it, two things is I think you, you'll find that their communications did consistently keep telling the union, look, these dates are coming up and we are going to go I, down if we I don't. I know what you're but, talking about and we may be reading the record a little bit differently, but still, why hide the information? If this is all so terribly important, why did they hide that information? Well, I think the only information that they can actually be ca characterized as hiding is the fact that there's an extension agreement. Not, right. Yeah, the extension agreement. Extension agreement, which I... If you hide something, it's as if you have an no, obligation to agreement. No, I, I'm not. Uh, that's why I don't want you to go down that path. I'm not accusing you and saying whether you were obliged or not obliged. I went. I did lots of labor negotiations. I'm not suggesting you were obliged as a matter of law, but it is curious that you would make your opening argument when you're sitting on a record in which your client did not reveal information about the point you start out with. That is the posture of the relationship between your client and the federal government. It was hidden. It was hidden. I'm not saying someone intentionally meant to, it was hidden. I don't dispute that they did not proactively disclose right. this information. All right. So I don't understand. What's important your as starting a point just isn't weighty to me then, given that, given that point. And then I'll tell you the other thing, just so you understand, you got to understand this is a case in which the board is owed great deference. So you got that one problem that I look at. The other problem is uh, when you, you're uh, wondering whether or not an impasse is reached late in the ball game at a point you're now saying we're getting really too close. The employer changed the uh, offer that was on the table. Well, let me address both points because okay. I don't want to walk away from the first one because I, I do think it's important. Okay. Um, as to whether they they were didn't they declined to provide this information? No, they just didn't. I think don't use I, I the decline. Okay, they just did not. Okay. But my point is, they don't have a legal obligation. I totally to do that. agree. And it, and it is extremely important that they don't have that legal obligation. It was what they determined, and right right or wrong, they determined that they believe they could better get an agreement by not disclosing to the union that there was another six months or four months after the December 1st date. Totally get it. That's, I'm, I totally get it. And the problem what? is I don't understand your starting, your opening argument. You, you put it right in that, you put it right in that category, but in, in any event, I hear you, we're going past each other now. You okay. start, your opening argument raised something that caused me to think about what would, had been withheld. So your opening argument made no sense to me. The other thing is late in the ball game, as you're getting to a point that where the employer would want to claim an impasse, the employer switches the bargain or the offered bargain. Importantly. Yeah, I, I think what's important there with respect to the, that separate issue is that there's a distinction between the manner in which a proposal is implemented and the more preliminary question of whether an impasse has existed at the time of, of this um, offer being implemented. So I think we've met the, our burden of proof with respect to the fact that there was an actual impasse. I mean, the union made a series of wage proposals that always went up um, and ended at a proposal that was, 
you know, 58% above over a three-year contract over the, um, well, an amount that the FPS was not going to approve. And okay. so you have to make sure you get, get those things. And so and they were ASP is trying to press. They were consistently asking for mediation. But any, all right, so I had that right. whole picture in my head. All right, go ahead. Now, what's the next point? I, I'm not sure how you're just having, having established this. that there's the impasse. There is a question. Of, oh, no, I'm not buying that. There isn't. There's a question as to whether there's an impasse. Of course, you can't say there's an impasse. The parties were still negotiating and then the employer switched the bargain or proposed bargain very late mm-hmm. in the game. But the parties had definitely reached an impasse on the, the evidence in the record that, that on wages that they weren't going. The union was not going to drop down unless the party company agreed to mediate and it had no legal obligation to mediate yeah, that, that i don't think there's any dispute about as a matter of law no um, no there's no legal that's absolutely true but what we're trying to figure out is what were the parties thinking as they were doing all of these things the union was not suggesting we're done if they are saying we'd like to have a third party come in and assist us in these negotiations the company doesn't appear to be saying it's done if very late in the ball game they're coming in and saying, oh, incidentally, you know, what we have been proposing is change. We want to take some things off the table. That would be, for me, clear evidence there is no impasse because now the union has to think about that. But I would, respectfully, dis- deal. I would respectfully disagree with the idea that the union was saying that they had flexibility and, and room to move. The only way they were going to move was if, they, if we agreed to mediate. And since there was no legal obligation to mediate, they weren't going to move. They characterized it as a stalemate. They characterized it as an impasse. And I realize that doesn't necessarily mean that they legally are saying it is, that they have the knowledge right. of it. But it certainly shows how they thought and what they believed. They were not going to make any additional move. Well, you're not, you're, you're not. I hear your answers, but you're avoiding the question uh, that I'm raising. I don't know how you can say the employer thought he was at impasse. The employer came in with a new bargain. Well, all That's that happened, I, I, I hear what you're saying. The, the, but ASP, obviously, the, the template that they used to give the union the final offer was wrong. And they, right. they have said so. There's no issue about that. But it is not a case that ASP went up to the union and say, hey, listen, we plan to roll back all the things we've already agreed to, and we want to have a whole new set of things. They simply made a mistake in the manner in which it was being um, put forward. Um, they never stated that they intended to roll it back. The union never raised any concerns contemporaneously um, about the alleged omissions of these non-economic items. The union said specifically, we're upset that you haven't agreed to our proposal on wages. Um, there's no substantial evidence that they um, actually changed the terms and, and didn't put into effect the non-economic items. The board's decision doesn't spend a whole lot of substantial time discussing that issue because it has to do more with how you implement. I suppose that the board's order could be adjusted to say that yes, you lawfully implemented the wage portions, but there were certain aspects of the non-economic proposals that you failed to put in properly um, because of the way you did it. And you, the order no, could I be think more limited the board, to those points. As I'm reading the board's decision, they're simply looking to try and understand the party's positions at the moment the employer said you all were at impasse. One of the facts they point to is the employer came in. First of all, there weren't that many sessions, they say. And then they also said, and the employer very late in the game came in and changed the proposed bargain. That's all information the board is weighing with respect to the substantial evidence question. Um, right. So that's okay. I hear you. I see my, my time for, on direct is uh, expired. Nice so cats, it says a question. Yeah, let me ask you a couple of questions. I, I, I think you have a lot of facts in your favor, and I'm not terribly moved by the rationale about emailing and decelerating, but let me focus on what I think are some tough facts for you. So one is, um, Judge Edwards talked about the deadlines. As I read the record, it's actually a little bit worse for you to the extent that at one point, your client seemed to affirmatively misstate to the union the situation about the deadlines by saying that the government was requ- would require wages to go down to prevailing right. level as of December 1st, unless you had 
a new collective bargaining agreement in place. And that's false in two respects. One, this wasn't coming from the government and two, in any event, they had the extension at least through March. Why isn't that at least a pretty significant fact tending to show some degree of bad faith? Um, two reasons. I mean, one, I, I think it's an inartful statement to say FPS has reiterated the need for, because I think it's accurate that FPS had not reiterated. It was really the company that was reiterating it. But the, the real point is that if, if you're right, that that statement was factually incorrect, mm -hmm. that is no different than what happens routinely in the bargaining process. Um, if, you, if a company says, look, we're, we're, we're not willing to include a signing bonus to ensure ratification of this agreement, and then the company ultimately does agree to that signing bonus, the state, they may have made the statement they weren't willing to at a time when they were in fact willing to, and it's not true. Similarly, a company could say, we are offering you better wages than what our competitors pay. And if you say that at the bargaining table, it may be wrong, but the union has the obligation to, 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 to show that that's a wrong statement. I understand, I understand the general point if you say, this is my last best offer, and it turns out, guess what? It really wasn't. But when you say, here is a constraint imposed on us by the government, and it really wasn't imposed by the government, that seems a little bit different. We're talking, okay. about, we're talking about a process rule here where there's an obligation of good faith and you don't have to reach a result, but you do have to, um, you do have to be fair to the other side in the process. Well, remember that the constraint um, that you're talking about is really the contract starting December 1st and the opportunity that ASP had to pay for a few more months at the higher rates. But even if in February or January, before that extension expired, we had agreed to a contract with the union for particular rates. As soon as it got to be March 30th, everything was dropping to wage determination period. I, I, so I don't, I don't know if it was really that inaccurate. It just was inartful. Okay. I really do believe that, but thank you. Um, I will stop right now. And how about another idea that runs through the concept of good faith is you don't necessarily have to um, take a particular position, but you have to um, you have to have reasons for the positions that you take, and you have to communicate those to the other side. Um, mediation. You're not legally obligated to mediate, but you never even responded to four um, approaches on that score. And with regard to the off the the core economic bargaining, it seems like the union had some decent rationales for their positions. They said we hadn't gotten a raise for a long time in the past, and we're just asking for what people in other buildings are getting. And there's really not much evidence that um, the company had a reasoned response to those points. I think the, the comparison is when you say that the union had um, made these requests, there was a if, if you were a company and you have a contract with the union and mid-contract, the union comes in and says, we want to pay you a dollar more. We want you to pay us a dollar more. And the company ignores it. I mean, now a good company should say, you know, we don't have an obligation to, and so we're not going to. But the company instead just ignores it. It's not an unfair labor practice for the, for the company not to respond to that. Everything that we're talking about here are I mean, law. I, I don't dispute these are hard bargaining tactics, but they're lawful. They really are lawful under. Wait a minute. The hypothetical you just gave was middle. Uh, you're in the middle of a contract. That's the hypothetical you're using, not the bargaining for a new contract. That's entirely different. Of well, course, I'm talking employer, about the general an employer who's in the middle of of a contract with, and there there's no bargaining to get a new agreement because the time has arrived. Of course, an employer would told the union to go fly a kite if they came in and said, oh, you know, it would be nice to have a raise, even though the contract doesn't 
That's not a good example. Well, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that you can ignore you can ignore when you don't have a legal obligation to respond. You can choose. Well, you not do to when you're in the middle of mid when you're in the middle of collective bargaining. That's different as opposed to being in the middle of a contract where there is no duty to bargain. You are bargaining for a new contract. You have legal oh. obligations. It's completely different from when there is no legal obligation to bargain. I don't think there's any board precedent that, that asserts that. The board precedent instead says that it's a permissive subject to bargaining, not a mandatory subject to bargaining. And I think that's the difference. Judge. Wait, that what is, is a, a, what is a permissive subject of bargaining? Mediation is a completely permissive oh, no, subject. No, no, no. We are, you're misunderstanding our question. Okay, I'm not going to pursue it. You're, you're completely, of course, mediation is not mandatory. What we're looking for here is, if you look at the board cases, and that's why we give them deference, the board's trying to find out on the record whether there's information indicating that both sides were at, at an end. And, and what the board did here was say, taking the evidence as a whole, we can't reach that conclusion that they had reached an end. Uh, and, and there was still more to be done. And we're, my colleague and I have been posing questions that cause us to wonder whether uh, the, the board's right or wrong uh, on that uh, legal inquiry, given certain circumstances here, given you withheld information, given there weren't very many sessions, uh, given that you changed the bargain. I mean, those are all things the board looks at and says, no, we can, we're not prepared to conclude that the more bargaining uh, wasn't necessary before someone could say, we've done, we've done all we can do, and that's it. And at that point, the employer can say, we're done. The board said, not yet. Well, my, my point, and I think this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, is that there was unquestionably an impasse on the wages. There was no break that was going to happen until the company agreed to mediation, which it didn't have an obligation to do. And what the company was trying to do, as every employer tries to do in these cases when it wants to get a contract, is the company tried to break that impasse. Um, and and the, the steps that it took to break that impasse, we believe, were Lawful well, steps the, that he's the, the thing that you politely or, or interestingly uh, character, I was really curious to how you were going to characterize it, having done many of these bargains. The late change in the proposal is huge. That for me ended it when I read this record. There could not be an impasse. If you make a late change in the bargain, the other side now has reason to believe there's more to talk about. There isn't any question. If you've done it as much as I did it, that is a clear signal to the other side. I'm coming in with a changed proposal. That means there are more things to talk about. You're not close to an impasse at that point. Now, you characterize it as a mistake and this and that. I found that very amusing, given my experience. It's not a mistake. It's evidence of no impasse. And that's what the board was looking at. You changed the, you changed the proposed deal, and you tried to brush it off, and you were trying not to smile. It's a horrible mistake if you're trying to argue for impasse. You cannot say you're at impasse if you are coming in that late in the game, hiding information with respect to what's going on with the uh, feds, whether you have to tell them or not, and you change the proposal. You're not at impasse. All right. Well, my time, my time has expired, and I think I have made an effort to address that argument. Okay. I'm prepared to readdress it, but I don't just want to take time. Just, so just a lot, one last question on that. That, that last best and final offer, which changed a bunch of terms, were any of those, I thought all of the changes made the offer more favorable to the employer. They did. Um, no, I think it was, it was a variety of different provisions, some, some better, some worse. It simply was the wrong template to use. It wasn't the one that the parties have been having. It was, a, it was the wrong well, one to here. bring forward. It wasn't an effort. There was no discussion with the union of, hey, we're, we're putting a whole bunch of new issues out here. I had thought, thought the company that. obviously thought the only thing they were doing was um, putting mean, into if, place wages that were different. If it's, a, if it's a some better, some worse proposal, I'm with Judge Edwards. I had thought it was a just completely better for the company proposal, which is to me, if, if that's what it was, then to me, it would be not a sign that the impasse might be thawing, but that you're, you're, you're clearly at impasse and you're starting to play hardball on implementing a post-impasse offer, but. That's um, the way, was, I, just, that's the way I see the uh, regressive offer that the right. company made. 
but I don't think it was, an, I don't think the record indicates that it was an effort to change all those items. The only thing it was trying to change was the position on wages. But I understand the point you're making. Okay. All right, if there are no more questions, uh, Ms. we'll give you a couple minutes and reply, Mr. Hickson. <clears throat> Good morning, may it please the court, Michael Hickson for the NLRB, seeking full enforcement of the board's order. This court has consistently recognized that the existence of a valid bargaining impasse is an affirmative defense, and that the board deserves special deference in determining whether a party has carried its burden of proving that defense. Here, ample evidence in the record supports the board's determination that the company simply failed to carry its burden of proving that there was a valid impasse on November 28, 2017. Mr. If Hickson, if yes. I can uh, ask you to follow up on the questions that uh, I think all three of us were asking at the end, and that is this last uh, offer by the company to go back to the even lower wages, why wouldn't that cause the union to say, if we weren't at impasse before, we sure as heck are now. Your Honor, I think that the board case law is that when a company, when a party makes a last minute uh, dramatic change in its bargaining proposals, that the bargaining process requires more time for the parties to fully explore whether there is a path to an agreement. And the company here at the 11th hour replaced previously proposed increases to wage and benefits with wage and benefit cuts. But then on top of that, it introduced a raft of brand new non-economic proposals into the negotiations at the 11th hour. All, all, of, which, all of which were better for the company. I'm, Your Honor, frankly, I'm not positive about that, Your Honor. I know there are, there are a number of non-economic proposals um, you know, gear up and gear down time, paid breaks, temporary employees, full-time employee status, a number of others. Um, I know that some of them were worse for the union. I'm frankly not sure, but, but the point I think your honor is even if they were all worse for the employees and better for the company, that, that would only underscore the need for further bargaining because yeah, the I mean, company- Yeah, they were seeing, yeah, just understand the three of us you're hearing slightly uh, expression of slightly different instincts. My instinct as someone who used to do this is if you came in with everything now being reduced, I would see a possibility of maybe I can get the wages up now because they're suggesting if I agree to take away some of those non-economic things, which they've now proposed to take away, I, have, I may have a way now to get the wages up. That's why it's inconceivable to me that there's an impasse. So I don't see everything bad. Uh, as being evidence that it, it must be impasse. I see it, I'm not sure what the board said about this, but I would see that as an opportunity for the union to say, aha, they're giving us an opening to uh, give back these non-economic matters and maybe we can bump the wages up now. That's, that's the bargain that we got to work on now. Right, absolutely, Judge Edwards. I, I agree with that perspective. I mean, the company injects these non-economic non -economic proposals into the negotiations at the last minute, and then they proceed to unilateral implementation without any meeting with the union, without so much as discussing with the union, these brand new non-economic proposals. And now, and the, so if I remember, remind me if I'm right, I think the board was essentially saying that now everything's on the table, which militates right. against an impasse finding. That's absolutely right, Your Honor. For yeah. example, there's there's one point in the board decision where the judge says that if anything, the piling on of a host of non non economic topics onto into the negotiations at the last minute presented the party right. with a brand new platter of options. So yeah, the union, go ahead, go ahead. So the union with these new these brand new proposals presented to it, if the party the parties then it was necessary to exhaust the collective bargaining process for the parties to explore avenues of agreeing on those proposals because there had been no discussion of them. Mm -hmm. And they could have made uh, avenues to agreement amongst the non-economic proposals themselves. And they also could have discussed trade-offs between the non-economic proposals and the economic proposals. And I would add, uh, you know, for example, there's, there, and we cite cases in our brief that say that this is a, a commonplace, uh, very common 
method of compromise in collective bargaining is trade-offs and deals between economic and non-economic. And I'd like to address the point. Oh, sorry. So let's just, just help, help me think about this because I have less experience than Judge Edwards in this area, but a somewhat different instinct. So let's assume just to simplify this, that they're bargaining over three different issues and they're sort of, the employer is roughly at $26 on wages, $6 on health contribution, and an hour a day on break time. And then at the last minute, they come in with a dramatically new offer, which says $20 on wages, $4 on health, and 10 minutes on break time. You think that's, um, that could tend to break an impasse because the union will say, oh, this signals flexibility because maybe we can trade X for Y? Or you think they're more likely to say, this is, this is crazy, this is much worse. They're, they're, they're moving backwards. So if we weren't done before, we must be done now. Uh, Your Honor, I, if I could, I'd try to make a couple of points to respond. The first is that, um, well, I guess the first is that there it, it's really not a question of whether an impasse was broken. Because exactly. As that's, we, exactly. As we, that, that's your answer. The, the assumption that my colleague is making is that does this break an impasse? It wasn't an impasse. It's proving that there is no impasse. That That's right, Your Honor. And not only that, as we point out in our brief, the the company before the board expressly conceded that if there had been an impasse in September, which it had contended, the, the company expressly conceded, as we point out in our brief to the court, that if there was an impasse in September, that that impasse was broken well, well in advance of the events of November. But on top of that, I would also respond that, yes, I think that, again, the, the case law in cases like Herman Brothers, Sentinella Hospital, EIS break part, board cases that we cite in our brief, the board's decision here is consistent with those precedents that when a party is suddenly introducing new proposals that are that had not previously been raised and or that are inconsistent with a radical divergence from its prior bargaining positions at the last minute, that the further bargaining is required between the parties to see if those changed proposals allow the parties an avenue to reach an agreement and they need to fully exhaust all avenues. And I think it's important here um, in your hypothetical, I know that you, Judge Katzis had spoke about, you know, kind of a change in economic issues, but I do think it's really important here that the change at the last minute was both on the economic issues and, and, and on a raft of non-economic non proposals. Right. And I need to respond to the point that Mr. Dowd made, the contention the party, uh, the company has raised, that this was somehow inadvertent or a mistake. There is no evidence in the record. And I have to stress that the company had the evidentiary burden in this case to prove an impasse. When Mr. Cropper on behalf of the union testified he went through point by point and he pointed out all the changes. Well, I don't know about all the changes. He pointed out several changes in the non-economic proposals between the, the final offer that was ultimately implemented and the company's earlier tentative agreements on those very same non-economic topics. Then it's the company's turn to put on its evidence and it put on zero, zero evidence as to why it suddenly introduced these brand new non-economic proposals into the negotiations at the 11th hour. So there is no support for the notion that this was a mistake or inadvertent. And it's also simply incorrect to suggest as the company has, that there's no evidence that the company implemented. I mean, first of all, it would be the company's burden to prove that it withdrew the proposals and that they were a mistake. It never did that. But on top of that, it stipulated, as we point out in our brief, at appendix page 485, the company stipulated before the board that it implemented all of the terms of its offer, which included both the economic and the non-economic, and that those terms then went into effect on December 1, 2017. 
I don't have much time left, Your Honors, but if I could quickly address just two more points. The company here did more than just uh, fail to share with the union certain information that it had. It made repeated affirmative misrepresentations to the union during the bargaining regarding purported FPS deadlines and allegedly impending uh, FPS reductions to reimbursement rates. It presented October 31 and November uh, 17 as hard deadlines externally imposed by the FPS when the record shows that that was untrue and when the company knew that that was not true. And then on top of that, it specifically tied the last three alleged deadlines that it asserted, the October 31 deadline, the November 17 deadline and the never November 20 deadline, it tied all of those to the false claim that if those deadlines weren't met, that the FPS would cut the reimbursement rates on December 1, 2017, when the company well knew that the FPS had already committed to continuing the status quo reimbursements through March 31, 2018. And the other point I'd like to make, uh, if I can very briefly, just in connection with the discussion we were having about the last minute introduction of proposals, I think it's also important to remember that the, prior to November 17, the company had repeatedly claimed other supposedly final offers and other supposedly hard deadlines. And the parties, of course, continued to bargain and exchange proposals even after those supposedly final offers and deadlines had come and gone. So the union had no reason to understand that the company's latest claim of a November 17 final offer was any different than those prior claims. Your honors, I'm over my time, but I would welcome the opportunity to answer any additional questions that the court may have. I have a question about the remedy, the part of the remedy that orders uh, the company. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, I think I may have, <laughs> I think I may have uh, confused this NLRB case with one I'm hearing tomorrow. I thought, I so, thought, so. <laughs> yeah, I will withdraw the question. I started to say that, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> You're in the wrong. All right, Judge Edwards, you and I are sitting again tomorrow. Right. So, you know wrong what I'm talking about. All right, Judge Kansas, are you, do you have another question? No, I'm set. Thank you. All right. Then, uh, thank you, Mr. Hickson, Mr. Dowd, why don't you take two minutes? Uh, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll try to take less than that. I, I, I think that the point that Mr. Hickson was making about misrepresentations is dealt with in our brief. And I'm, I don't think I need to reiterate that point. The one thing that I, I do wanna focus on is that the court obviously has issues about what it perceives to be changes in proposals and the like that were done in a, at what the court has talked about being uh, poorly timed. But I, want, I urge the court to look at the cases that we've cited at page 32 of our brief, which talks about um, existing National Labor Relations Board decisions and law and precedent that say that there are three exceptions to the rule that there must be an overall impasse before an employer may implement its last best and final offer. I want to reiterate that these are by law three exceptions where you don't have to have an overall impasse. One is when the union engages in conduct that's calculated to frust frustrate agreement or to frustrate impasse. That occurred here because the union insisted on mediation as a, as a way of moving forward and the company doesn't have an obligation to do it. So that was an action by the union that frustrated agreement. The union Second, did not insist on that as a condition of continued bargaining. It insisted on it as a condition. That that's, it, they just proposed, they said, it would, we really think that would be a good thing to have. They did not say we will not negotiate unless you agree to mediation. Well, I, I don't think that's accurate. I think that the, the actual communications by the union, if you look at our citations in our, our brief, were that they, would, they did not intend to change their wage offer, uh, but, the, uh, but we can, they said, we, we've gone as far as we can with our wage offer, Unless you want to participate in mediation, then we'll then we'll talk more. Okay. So I do think they conditioned it any movement on on that by they conditioned any movement on wages um, by the company having to agree to mediation. But more okay. importantly, it's the second point. It says when an employer can demonstrate that an impasse on one critical issue precluded agreement, 
then it was okay to go forward and, and try to break that impasse through uh, implementation of a last and final proposal. I think that is the, the key finding here. That yeah, I mean, you do have those three exceptions and the only one that, that might work is the second one that you're talking about. The problem you have is you change the proposal. You can't get around it and you described it as bad timing, a mistake, et cetera. But the board, the board took it for what it was and they made findings adverse to you. We're supposed to defer to those findings. You reopened, the, uh, the, you opened, the, put everything back on the table again. And that's exactly what the board said. And the case law supports that. You have no exception around that. The case law supports it. And the board made an adverse finding against you on that. Okay, I, I understand the, your position on that, Judge Edward. Okay, thank um, you, Sadao. Judge would, would ask, Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, wait, Judge Cassis has a question. Just back, to, back to that last best offer. I want, I want to make sure I understand your characterization of it. Do you think it is a um, new and different offer which just opens up new issues? Or do you think it's better characterized as, I'll just call it for shorthand, purely retrogressive? Just takes what was offered before and makes all the terms worse for the union. We, we, I would have I would have to look at it. I, yeah, I'm sorry, good. did not mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Wait, what's the better characterization? I understand <laughs> you, uh, that might might be important to me. All right, like Mr. Hickson, I'd have to say I honestly don't know no. without looking at the documents and comparing them, which are in the record. I'd have to look at it. I'm and sorry. About that. It is it is your burden, but okay. All right. All right. If there are nothing more, more questions, for me, okay. If there are no more questions, then thank you, gentlemen, and your case is submitted. This honorable court is now adjourned until Wednesday, February 17th at 9.30 a.m.